Oh, it's a really short. It's a really short animated video. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I expected that you know, like the usual long animation. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Peter Kern. I'm the co-host with Veronica Mota of the Music Makers Hack Lab. And uh, each year, as part of the Hack Lab, um, we bring together a group of international artists. Actually, last year it was only from Berlin, although still very, very international. But they come to us from around the world, and they have a week to work together on new musical performances and collaborations. Uh, the essential technology to this is not so much machines or circuits or code as much as it is human interaction and collaboration and improvisation. Um, Ioana has actually been a participant in the Hack Lab in 2019, one of those years in the before times. Um, and uh, so this year we have a new group of people. Each year we also bring in uh, uh, an the input program is a way to get inspiration and ideas and, and challenge our thinking a little bit to start out the week. And so that's what we get to do today. So uh, this process will lead up till Sunday in Houtzwey. We move from Silent Green over to Kreuzberg. And on Sunday afternoon, I hope you come and see our concluding performance. But first, to scramble our brains and give us new ideas and see some work, we're happy to wel welcome Joanna Vrema Moser here to Silent Green today in this very imposing, exciting space uh, to show us her work. And we really appreciate the support of the Shape Plus platform to make this happen, uh, along with all of our other partners. And that's all I've got to say. So I will turn over, turn over the room to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So yeah, thank you for the invitation, and uh, I will start with a li little introduction of what I am and where I came from. So um, I started my artistic career as a ballerina. I was a ballerina for 10 years, uh, and uh, at the same time while I was uh, dancing this ballet, I was also growing up on the stage, so I was surround surrounded by a lot of uh, very interesting elements, including a lot of makeup and costumes and wigs and things like that. And uh, that moment of my childhood really inspired me later on. Um, I was also very, very in love with Barbie dolls. Like, I loved Barbie dolls a lot. And um, at the same time, I started to slowly uh, draw things. And uh, I became in love with drawing. And uh, what I didn't know back then is is that uh, what I was drawing was actually sound. So I was doing this large sound notations, compositions, um, and I was always trying to figure out moments of tensions in line, in, um, in movement, basically, because I was combining what I did on the stage with the drawing. And so I discovered circuits, so, which was a, a big realization for me because it was the, exactly the right format for uh, my thinking because here I could combine this, uh, all this knowledge in dance, so the movement, with, uh, with drawing. And because basically what circuits are, they're lines, they're drawings where electrons move. Right, so they mo go from one part to the other, they interact with different elements, and they create certain movement, and that movement can be reflected in music or sound or um, any other type of motion. Um, so I started to build these circuits. I moved to Berlin from Romania. Um, I learned electronics slowly, so I, I started to put together a practice. And the first things I did was that I started to imagine, okay, well, I work with all these electronics, which most of them were actually donated to me. So a lot of people would donate to me different components, and then I would hoard them, and I would start to uh, categorize them. And I also started to think, OK, uh, what happens with all these things that we produce, right? We make all these instruments, we create all this technology, and this ends up in a wasteland eventually. And at some point where it piles up, it will create kind of like a geological layer on Earth of this electronic uh, waste. And I started to imagine how life could emerge in that electronic uh, waste. And so came the first piece I did, which was a Zurkubuk Nuxtri dance. And it was a creature living in a nut, a pterigota alatata. Um, and, with, and it would uh, mimic the sounds of uh, mating crickets. 
Um, and then I kept going and finding little uh, interventions and objects that I would create from this electronic uh, leftovers. So for instance, this was in Seoul in South Korea, uh, where I found a crack and I created a creature in this crack um, to kind of in the remembrance of this uh, electronic markets that they used to have in this uh, area that were all gone. So kind of like a um, craft, crafting electronic markets where they would make all these parts by hand and because of gentrification, of course, they were uh, kind of filled with commercial centers and they disappeared. So I left this trace there from these parts that I collected from the market. Um, and then I entered, entered into this uh, organic realm, so I got interested in trees and mostly leaves, and I discovered that you could convert uh, leaves into loudspeakers, so by spinning them around with a long wire and putting a magnet inside, I could make a, a diaphragm of a loudspeaker. So I did this piece called Thermofrunzus, which was reacted to the environment fluctuations, um, and it would, as it would dry, it would change the sound slowly. Um, and for sure, like, because uh, for me the diagram was so important, I would always display it. So the circuit is on display, you can see exactly what is happening there. Usually the circuits look like this, so it's very uh, organic looking, although it's not organic. Um, and you can see everything uh, what is exposed. And then later on in 2021, um, I became interested in radio, in the radio phenomenon. Um, and especially into trees and the entang entanglement with this radio phenomenon. So I discovered that basically um, trees behave like massive radio antennas. So the leaves of the trees uh, recept uh, uh, radio frequencies and there is quite a lot of study on that, uh, how this happens. Um, but what I also thought very interesting is the fact that the tree itself as an organism is situa situated half above earth and half underground. And underground, it's kind of connected to this entangled uh, world of uh, roots and uh, then the mycorrhizal uh, circuits. So it's like a large circuit underground. And in a sense, it, it's also called cordially the wood wide web because the trees can communicate with each other through these uh, circuits. And um, at the same time, up in the corolla of the tree, uh, the trees capture our interferences, so our disturbances, uh, the internet, our internet. So then I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I, I searched a little bit further and I found this uh, patent from George O'Squire where he's, he's finding that if you take a nail and you pin it inside a tree, you can listen to radio to it. So I was intrigued by it and I wanted to kind of uh, see how this works. And then I found more declassified army patents uh, where they were trying to use, it was just an idea at some point, it didn't really get implemented, but it was this idea how to use the forest and transmit through the forest. Um, so I looked at this uh, construction and I thought, what if I can make a device that actually displays these moments of interferences in between the two communication networks. So one, you have the communication network above, the our communication network, so the human one, and below you have all these uh, roots and uh, its own ecosystem. So, but they interfere each other, and it's actually, there's a lot of studies that show that uh, trees suffer quite a lot from the EMF radiation. So EMF radiation, as you might know, is like all that we use for our telecommunications, for our internet, and so on. So I decided to, to test, and I took a coil, and I made a very DIY kind of contraption, which I installed in Grunewald, so next to Berlin. And this is what I got to here. So 
So the crazy thing is that it was a radio, a Romanian radio. And I thought, <laughs> how is this even possible? Like, I, I, and I have a witness, I'm not faking the story, you know. I, I was there, I was like, this is incredible. Actually, it was a diaspora radio with Romanian music. So I was like, oh, this is amazing, you know. Now uh, I'm just going to make a piece out of it. So I took this, uh, this devices and I started to create a circuit which was inspired by this crystal radio circuit. So a very simple circuit, just a lot of amplification with a large toroidal coil. So this coil around the tree captures the electromagnetic waves uh, of the tree, so the field of the tree. Um, and then I just uh, hook it up to this amplifier and uh, on this brass pieces you could hear uh, the sounds. So whatever the trees were capturing. And I started to place them in different cities. So this was in Berlin at the CKU. And here it was very loud because there's a lot of trains. And it's a, like a train station next to it. So they were very percussive and loud. Um, and I installed it in a botanical garden in Yash, so on the, on the northern side of Romania, northeast. And there, for instance, was very quiet because it was in the botanical garden. So I, I started to, yeah, to understand a little bit what is going on with these trees and um, yeah, to obtain different textures of sound depending where I was installing them. Um, and then uh, I thought, well, you know, it's quite interesting this, but it's a bit of a waste to just do uh, artworks with this and not share it more. So um, I decided to start doing a series of workshops and uh, to teach basically the circuitry and the research that I collected uh, to larger collectives of people, because I always find it very way more direct to interact through the workshops with, uh, with people. So actually, this is something that I did for all my works. So I always like do a work, and then I do a workshop, because I want to share the, what, what I collected. Um, and now we will go to the most fun part, uh, this is um, this is a parallel exploration. Um, so while I was doing all this electronics, um, as I as I said at the beginning, I still had this uh, really intense urge of for a ba ballet, for a pink thing, and all of a sudden, once it hit me that I should make an alter ego. So. Slowly, this is how Coqueta was born. So Coqueta is my alter ego uh, that embodies all this like uh, makeup world that I experienced as a child. And uh, I started to look at the history of makeup, so to investigate a little bit what happened there. So makeup is a very controversial thing. And so in on one sense, it's a sign of liberation, oppression. It's also the earliest ritual of humans. So it's one of the first things that we did as humans. Um, and then I stumbled upon this device, and this device is called the beauty micrometer. And what this does is that it measures the female imperfections, uh, so you can apply proper makeup. And the person on the right, you might know him, is Max Factor. So Max Factor became a brand of makeup, which is quite famous right now. So I was like, hmm, this is quite interesting. On the other side, I was looking at the way women were kind of represented in electronics, because coming from Romania, it was quite an exotic thing to do, be doing what I was doing. And, um, and I saw, uh, yeah, there's this, uh, this case of the refrigerator ladies. So uh, as you might know, in this uh, ENIAC computer, these are one of the first pro programmers, of computer programmers that work on the ENIAC. But uh, for a very long time, until very recently, we believed that they were refrigerator ladies, which meant that they were just posing beautiful in front of the computer to make the computer kind of sexier, I guess. So that's what people believed. And uh, then I also looked at this kind of thing. So these are the covers of a computer magazine from Yugoslavia, Ratsunar. Um, and where you can see this, uh, exactly this image of this refrigerator ladies, so the ladies are posing in front of the computer, it's all very sexy. Um, and late, lately I found this video, which I think started like for good the project. Let's hope it works. Now, a computer for women. How did the idea come about? I had the idea in a dream originally, and then the next night I dreamt about it again. 
then I probably had the same dream for the next 40 or 50 nights. And I thought, yes, I'll do that. And that became the Petticoat 5? Yes, the Petticoat 5. It's a computer made by women for women. So, let's take a look at it. Now, the first thing you notice is the shape of the keys. That's right. They're designed to, to make it easier to type with long nails. Oh, that is a good idea. And what is this? Well, that's a place to put your rings. Ah. And on the side here, we have a tissue dispenser. Uh -huh. <coughs> and over here is a vanity mirror, which pops up when you press this button. And the space bar is an emery board. So I suppose you could fix your makeup while you work? Well, yes, you could. Yeah. So this is where it all started. Um, and uh, while I was walking on the street, I discovered one day a box of... Um, like a makeup box, and I decided, oh great, let's build this uh, big diva computer. So I started, and I started to build a ser series of instruments. This was the first, it was a filter box. And then I found a wig box, and I created a circuit inside of it, like a, mi a mixer, and uh, I think yeah, there was also the circuit for the electronic lipstick. So slowly, 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 I started to have a few more instruments, and then I brought them on stage. Uh, in the beginning, I was very insecure about it, but I started to perform with it slowly, slowly. Then I took my old shoes, I put some microphones inside them so I could make very loud pops with the shoes. Um, then I took my shoes and I made a modular system in my shoes. So I started to really get deeper into electronics and to understand the analog systems. So I was designing my modules and copying from bits and pieces from other places, putting them together. Um, and uh, then I was, during the pandemic, I was, what should I do? So I made a breast synthesizer. This is a titstronic where you can spin your nipples. And, uh, and I started, uh, unfortunately, it was the pandemic, so I felt a little bit ridiculous to go with this on stage. But uh, it's still in process, so maybe one day it will be finished and uh, still, it actually exists. It's just that I performed it only once so, because of the pandemic. And then I looked at makeup, so going back to makeup, because this is what started the whole journey. And I started to go deeper to understand how these makeup uh, devices are made. And uh, I realized that, uh, for instance, lipstick, it has, a, it has a long history that is entangled with toxicity. So lipsticks usually are quite toxic, like they're made of arsenic, a uh, little bit of lead. And I thought, well, that's kind of funny because I sold her so much with lead. And then I put lipstick on my lips, you know, so it's kind of a conjoined action. So I said, OK, how should this this device sound like. So I built an electronic lipstick instrument where I cut the lipstick in two, I put a potentiometer inside so when you would raise the lipstick you could make a sound. I had a little bit of a, a pressure sensor on it so I could uh, apply it on the lips and make a sound. Um, and this is how it ended up. Uh, this is me playing the lipstick, electronic lipstick as a guitar, like uh, it's called the lipstick solo. So Yeah, you get the idea. So uh, I continued and I looked around, around on more of these devices, for instance, the eyelash cur curler, which is a kind of a strange device that curls your eyelashes. So I thought, well, this really looks like a switch in a sense. So I kind of made an electronic switch from it. Then I thought, okay, foundation, you know, foundation is this layer that you put over your face, like a pate, like you spread it everywhere. And to me, it's like, uh, it sounds very, no it's crispy and noisy somehow, because it's, I don't know, that's how I, I imagine it. Um, and uh, I continued also thinking about, okay, what you put on the face as well, the blush. So I made these brushes for the cheeks. 
uh, and this is a selection of the face uh, application. So we have foundation, in the middle we have powder, and on the right we have blush. That's foundation. That's how it went. It, uh, I continued and I did all the devices. And then during the performance, I would end up covered in a lot of makeup. Uh, I started to build this whole suite, like a Hollywood case, filled with uh, all my instruments that I built over time. So as you can see there, at some point I piled a lot of them. And I would basically go on stage and I would uh, apply makeup, uh, so step by step, uh, into kind of a noise uh, texture and uh, then I would also exhibit the instruments. So now we get to the central part. Um, so while I was doing all these electronics, I started to be way more concerned of what is actually inside of them. Um, and then this year, I, s I found that, um, <coughs> I found these chips uh, that look very funny. They're kind of like a little octopus, and uh, they are actually the first integrated circuit that was commercially available from Fairchild. Um, and I started to work a little bit with them and to see if I can restore them. So I made a piece where I kind of restored them. Uh, I made them oscillate and I put them, I preserved them through large pieces of candy. So this is actually sugar in it. Um, and then uh, later, like uh, this also this year, actually in spring, I wanted to go even deeper into this process and to understand how we can bring these uh, complicated circuits because at this point we have so much complicated hardware and we do so many great things with it but we have no idea how it actually works anymore, right? So this is a bit of a problem, I think, for our future. So I thought I would like to bring this, all these uh, complicated things to a simple form and to teach people how semiconductors work because we use so many se semiconductors. So I looked at the history of transistors and um, I made this project where I uh, started to uh, find kind of the core of uh, all all of this information revolution. So by tracing all the history behind it, looking at how these things are mined, where they come from, and uh, how we did we end up to this thing, very complicated thing that we have today. Um, and of course, looking at the beginning at uh, crystal radios. So you might know that crystal radios, you know, they really use pieces of crystals. So this was the first and simplest semiconductor one could make. Uh, so I looked at those and I looked how you could hack those. So you can see this is a crystal radios where the crystals are actually the credit card chip or a, a razor blade. Actually, the razor blade one is from the World War II where how soldiers were communicating with it. And I thought, well, this is interesting. But the problem with this is that these are all demodulating things. So you could hear radio with them, but you cannot produce, you cannot send radio with them. So to send something, you need to create an oscillation, right? Uh, and then, this is the case of the AM, you modulate that oscillation, and then you can send your signal far away, you can communicate with the other people. So I thought, oh, well, this is kind of hard to do, actually, because, uh, as you might know, like, um, when you have an oscillation, if you have an oscillator, and you don't have a transistor involved there or something that is active, the oscillation will start, and slowly it will de decay, because there's nothing to push it. It's like, it's like a swing, yeah, like you have a swing, with a kid on it, so you push the kid. Uh, if you don't keep pushing the kid, he's gonna at some point stop. So what the semiconductor does, it's that it's pushing each time just the right amount to make that kid swing perpetually. So he's like swinging, swinging. And this is how you create the sound as well, right? You make an oscillator. And then I found this inven invention, which is the crystodyne, and it's exactly that, but it's using um, uh, a piece of crystal to make Oh, an no, oscillation. 
So as you might know, it's quite hard to make a transistor. This is one of the hardest things to do DIY. You can't really make it. It's super complicated. But I found this circuit, and I realized that if, uh, if I could convert it, and then also I found this invention, which is like a, a Neil Steiner's uh, invention, in which he discovered that uh, you don't actually need those crystals. You can even take some scrap metal and you can burn it. So here you can see. So you burn that scrap metal and you end up with this uh, surface with black spots. And in those black spots, you have an amazing uh, phenomenon happening where it, it actually amplifies the sound. So you can make an oscillator with those black spots. So this is what it ended up. I tried to, uh, so here you have an oscillator, for instance, with an old piece of chain and an old screw, um, and they oscillate. It's very hard to make it oscillate. It's not like a, a normal oscillator. So. This is the screw. So this became screaming minerals, because I realized, OK, I can make all these minerals scream, and I can make basically super simple oscillators that would uh, contain, as you see here in the diagram, there's only three components. You can take an old transformer, one capacitor, and you can make your own semiconductor, and you obtain a sound wave. So, But this is not the, just the beginning. Like You can modulate that sound wave, so you can uh, connect more of this together to create a synthesizer that is basically made of scrap metal uh, and without transistors. So this was quite interesting for me. Uh, but I thought I will not make an actual artwork with this uh, because it, it's kind of suited for a collective. So this project stayed in a collective. I started to do these workshops in which in each workshop we were exploring different sides of these semiconductors. So these are examples of the cat whiskers that the people would make. So they, you had to make this kind of pin that holds and touches the scrap metal. And different uh, participants made them differently. Uh, we created these instruments that had uh, as a central piece this handmade semiconductor. Um, so we made each participant would always make one. And then at the end, we would connect them together to kind of modulate that oscillation. Um, and yeah, it would uh, end up quite... Uh, here's an example of different semiconductors and an example also of um, modulated sound. And we ended up making a band. So I, I started this band uh, also with Teresa Dillon at some point. She was joining and screaming. And it was called the Screaming Minerals. It was about the history of extraction of minerals. So it, it included also some text. Um, and each of the participants had its screaming minerals. So then it was a very, very intensive, noisy performance. Uh, but uh, this was at No School in Avert. They have a very wonderful summer camp, which I recommend. OK, so now we get to the uh, kind of last and the main, the, actually, the reason why I came here. So <clears throat> I've been working a lot on a very strange field of science, of computer science, which is called fluidics. So I discovered once that this thing exists, and it was quite interesting to deep dive deep into it. Um, so fluidics, it's a, it's a computer science domain that got lost in the history. There's always a lot of these domains that get lost so because we, uh, we just keep some alive and we bury the others, so kind of like a selection. Um, and this fluidics uh, is actually from the 50s, so 50s, 60s. 
uh, and it was quite po uh, popular for people. So it was a, a moment where a lot of the devices was were made with these circuits. And as you can see, it can have different scales. So uh, today it's quite uh, it's quite a renaissance of fluidics. So there's microfluidics, for instance, which have a lot of use in laboratory. Um, but there's also the the larger pieces. And the reason why I was interested in this technology was because basically, as I said before, like I looked into this mineral realms of hardware, right? I looked how, how you can build up something in case it gets destroyed, how you can make a communication network from nothing, right? If you take a piece of scrap metal and you put it together, how you can bring back a technology in case we need to. Um, but what it was also very interesting for me was like, is there actually another way than going on this path that we already made, so like all mineral, all energy, electric? And I discovered this field, and it's actually, yes, it is possible, because fluidics, they don't use uh, electronic uh, electronics or el electric energy. Uh, they just use fluids, so water, air, mostly air. Um, and they look like that, which is quite I antithetical to the electronic circuits that you might know. It's always like straight lines and angles and blah, blah, blah. So these are actually very different in, uh, in formation. And all these shapes, uh, they guide streams of water or air. Um, this particular circuit is actually, I think it was sent in space. So the, the big uh, advantage of this technology over the electronic one is that it's, uh, because it's just matter, it's actually uh, very resistant to radiation. So you can send it into space, you can send it into, I don't know, places that have a nuclear fallout, and it will resist, like it will resist any condition. And the other thing that is amazing about it is that it's basically timeless. So because you have these shapes, you crave them into a material, and as long as you have air or water to pull into it, this thing will last forever. Yeah. So this was quite interesting for me. And then I went deeper into the archives. I started to look how you design these shapes, what these shapes are, because they all look so interesting somehow. So this is actually from the uh, design factory. It's like an image that I got so hard because you cannot find any documentation about this field. Um, and then I think this is a good uh, video to show a little bit how they work. They work using the quand effect, and I need to just go to select a little bit here, because we don't want to watch it all. Okay, here. So they, uh, they function using the quand effect, and the quand effect is uh, named after Romanian physicist Henry Quand. It's basically that annoying thing that happens when you want to pour from a glass, and it sticks to the surface of the glass instead of pouring in the cup, right? So this is the quand effect, and here it's, a, it's, a very, it's one of the only didactic videos that I could find about fluidics, where it ex explains a little bit how these shapes actually function. So, opa. I should have not played that. So. Пиаемся в повседневной жизни. Рассмотрим, почему он происходит. Эжекционные расходы с обеих сторон струи равны. При приближении стенки сечение снизу уменьшается. Скорость эжекционного расхода растет, а давление падает. Поперечный перепад давления прижимает струю к стенке. Эффект Куанда связан с подсасывающим действием струи. Эффект работает и на затопленной струе. На положение струи не влияет появление дополнительной стенки. So this is the part that is very important. От стенки может сигнал управления. Если его снять, Струя не возвращается к первой стенке. Таким образом, реализуется свойство памяти. So basically what you saw there is that uh, you could control that water jet. You could control where it moves with another jet. So this is basically a transistor. And uh, when I discovered this, I was like, okay, I want to, uh, to enact that to see how it works. So I found this database of fluidic shapes. 
because by using this process, you could make basically any computing building block. So computing building blocks are kind of, they're like Lego pieces that you connect together and then you create, I don't know, maybe a computer memory or something um, more complicated. Uh, and they, they are usually in the binary form, they're composed of these logic gates. So logic gates, there's, they're called, they have different conditions and they run on uh, Boolean al algebra. So what was very interesting was that you could have this, uh, this Boolean shapes, which usually are made of transistors, right? So they're all electronic, uh, an array of transistors, but you could have them in these funky shapes, and they work the same way. So by pushing streams and with the quant effect from one side to the other, you get basically the same thing, an analogy to uh, electronic computers but an analogy that is functional in itself. So you can use this computer by itself. You don't need uh, to translate it. Um, so I looked at the memory shape, and when I started the project in 2020, I, I, I discovered that this field, uh, and I started to, I focused on one shape. I was very kind of uh, fascinated with the memory, the, how to build a computer memory from this. Uh, so I took the shape and I made it from glass uh, with uh, the help of a wonderful Romanian glassmaker, uh, Marius Deac. So he made it uh, on my measurements, this uh, very complex shape. Um, and then I thought, okay, I want to make uh, an array. I want to make a shift register. So I put them together and I sketched uh, kind of a system and machine that would be always in feedback with itself, so it would uh, always memorize one bit of uh, information at a time. So in a sense, a very stupid machine. A machine that doesn't only write one bit of information at a time. Um, so I put it on, I built it up from glass and from wood. So it looked like this, uh, and then um, I thought, okay, well, I want to show also each time this machine is actually memorizing a one, so a one bit of information. So I built a glass speaker. So I took a spiral of glass and I put, you see in the middle, there's a little coil in there and underneath there's a little magnet. So each time I got a sound, I could amplify it like this. And then I also put a, a sensor and I put inside the, the water salt water, actually salt. Yeah, so I put a salt solution that would conduct electricity. And then each time uh, I would get this a little uh, bubble full, I could uh, track that and I could amplify it into a sound. So each time you hear the memory works, you get a little sound. So yeah, and then you can see how it actually functioned. So this was in 2020, uh, and I, I was dreaming to continue this research, and I finally managed to do that this year, which I'm very happy because I got a little bit of funding for it. Um, and I looked, I had to go deeper into the archives, so I'm actually going to finish with this. Um, I went deeper into the archives of the Technical University in Berlin, uh, and I found a lot of documentation about these fluidic shapes because you couldn't find anything. Um, and I also started to look at uh, computers like as a whole system. So this is a Moniac. It's one of the first, not really the first, one of the earliest fluidic computers. And uh, what it does is that it has all this um, uh, 
how you say, containers with water. Um, and it actually shows the economy of England. So by using water, it's uh, an analogous machine to the economy of England. So in this case, water is money. So money flows, water flows. Uh, and then you can symbolize by this flow and predict changes in the economy of the country with a flow of water. So, and it seems that it was so efficient that they actually used it a lot in predictions, but it was mostly kind of like a didactic system. So I thought, okay, what if I would do this for a larger system? Like, because basically this was in the 40s, so it's quite a long time ago. Um, and in the 70s, you know, the cybernetics began, everything we see, everything as a system, as an interconnected system. The world is an interconnected system where every change interacts and, and so on. So I thought, what if I would take this uh, schematic, which is from World Tree, it's the first computer program that predicted basically the end of the world. Um, but back then it was very controversial, so nobody believed it. Um, so I thought, what if I take this thing and I could uh, use Fluidix to make a large computer machines that would show uh, how this thing works. So I started to look at it. I started to look how these uh, predictions worked. And here you see in the first uh, square, that's the business as usual. So that's the path where we are on now. And this is from the 70s, but it seems that it's very accurate. So it's, we still are right on track um, for the destruction. And uh, on the right, we have a balanced uh, system. So there, uh, with a little bit of intervention and uh, our goodwill, we managed to balance the system. So I thought to make a machine that would uh, show these two algorithms. And this is a little sketch. And then I said, OK, like, let's see what are the, what's the hardware for the machine. So this in October, I went in Linz and I did a long research on these shapes, which you can actually see here. So these are the shapes. So uh, to make each of the shapes, it was very hard because uh, I was working on these old patterns, but they were, for sure, they were not accurate. So I had to um, etch them, then adjust, then I think each of them had like five or six iterations. Some of these shapes are actually inspired by the human anatomy, so physiology. Here you can see the equivalence element is actually quite similar to the, um, uh, our nasal oral system. Uh, here is an old uh, Soviet chip that was using the equivalence because this technology was actually used for quite a few years, so it was not really just a fantasy technology. Um, and these are other computer chips using fluidic shapes. Uh, so I ended up with these shapes, which are kind of uh, an educational toolkit. So I said, before I do a larger piece, I would like to understand the shapes, and I would like to teach these shapes. So I would like to show them to people, so they're kind of easier to... to so we kind of de deconspire the myths behind computation, because when you look at them, it's very easy to understand how things work. So I made this modular system of fluidic components, which you can also come here and have a look later on, how they look. They're just the test, so it's like version one. Um, and uh, I'm aiming to put them together into complex circuits. This is, for instance, an other, uh, to integrate them into larger pieces, um, like this. For instance, this is a binary counter. I call it the non-binary counter. And this is a, a large calculator. And yeah, and this is where I am right now with my research in fluidics. And uh, it just keep, keeps going. And I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take uh, questions from the audience first. Those of you out there online, keep typing. We're, we're also, we're, we're watching, as you're watching. That sounds creepy, but we're watching your questions and to pass them on. But questions from the audience? Everybody's mind is just blown. What, um, so so the, when the stuff was being used, what, what sort of things was it, um, I mean, you talked about applications like satellites, things like that. What were some kind of real world uses for the fluidic chips that you saw? 
uh, well, these ones that I showed you, the Volga jet system, this is how it's called, these were used in large uh, machines for, um, how to say, factories, so like uh, mechanical things, because they're actually, if you put air and it's like a pneumatic device, you could kind of use that to have the computational part of a arm, or robotic arm, or something like this. And some of them are currently used in airplanes, so a lot of the, the airplanes have the circuits inside in the wings or something for different, uh, for opening certain flaps or I don't know, like, uh, so they're, they're still being used, a lot of the shapes, but they're kind of got lost as a computing device more, it's more like uh, it's for automation rather than, uh, but in, uh, also in the East, uh, it was used a lot for, so the biggest uh, analog computer was made also out of water. I just didn't include it because it's a bit too much information, but there's like five or six computers that were running exclusively on water and air. Uh, flow dock in uh, England, so like proper numerical, uh, there's one Turing machine as well on water. So it was an, an analogous form of doing computing in a different way, and yeah, it's just kind of of got lost a little bit. <laughs> uh, and there was a sort of specific Romanian history to this too, distinct from whatever was going on with the Soviets. Uh, yes and no. I mean, for sure, uh, bec when I started the project, I went into a Romanian university in my city, and uh, everybody was working on this for medical applications as well. Ah, because ah. it's, uh, if you know, you know, with the COVID, also with the respirators, that can be, uh, like, these valves can create some kind of a mechanism that, you know, makes an oscillation, because you can make oscillators with them. For instance, here I have an oscillator, so you fill it up and... You can breathe in and out. Mm. So uh, they were working a lot of the on the medical applications more in Romania. But uh, yeah, I think we also had at some point something. I it's just super hard to find at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, any of us with a uh, uh, fighting off colds at the moment now can treat our our sinuses and throat with a newfound respect as fluidic computers. Um, do we have? Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Why, say it again. Why was why was it, why it was abandoned as a yes. Oh yeah, why it was abandoned. Well, it's yeah. very it's you know it's not as fast as the electronics. So the electronic counterpart uh, is way faster, and people wanted things to be small and very fast. So this is why it, they abandon everything that was slower in the process. You have a lot of these uh, alternatives. This is just one, you know, there were uh, magnetic computing. There was a lot of other devices that were uh, competing at some point. And because uh, it's, it was not efficient enough or like fast enough for supercomputing, uh, they, they left it behind. But for me, it's like, for me, I think it's, I don't know, I think we have to slow down a little bit, you know. <laughs> so that's why I find this technology very interesting because it's so slow you know it's so inefficient and uh, but it works you know you can compute numbers you can I mean this is for instance a, it, a, a calculator it adds up three binary numbers with three other binary, binary numbers so like two binary numbers basically so you can add up number with these things it's, it's just that it's of course much slower What would be the factors of, like, for example, uh, if you want to, uh, let's say, like the same way you work with synthesizers, like what would be, like what can you do with it in terms of sound, yes. but also in terms of oscillation and like basically modules? Yes, well, I am in this process of finding this out, actually, but uh, it's very great that you have oscillators in it. So I have here also, like, I think one of them. This is an oscillator. It has, like, a feedback loop. Um, and what happens when you put water into it is that it starts to, it creates a jet that moves uh, like this, like an oscillator. And if that's air, you can get the tone. So you can have, a, you can create like a wind instrument out of it. But if you want to transduce it to like, a, to electronic sound, then you have to use what I was using there where I was putting salt water and I was kind of, trans, yeah, I was transducing the one field to the other to get the, the electronic sound. So there are ways. I think there's a lot of uh, things to discover about it. So this is also why I like to present it. So I hope like people take it up and start to do things with it. There are like, yeah, for sure, like 
like you can find more things besides the sound of the water moving and uh, if you use the oscillator you can interrupt the oscillations with another uh, uh, flux, you know, so it's uh, it's more or less the same thing. It's just that, yes, you use the physical materials, so you have to have air, which will make... <laughs> mm. I was saying that it reminded me of like the water clocks, uh, like that was used also in ancient time to like to measure time, but also like this kind of like uh, tension between the pressure and the water applying pressure and so on, and having a like a cl uh, closed loop in a way. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's very beautiful that I I always found fascinating these machines and especially computer because we kind of. Uh, with all these uh, things, what we try to build is models of our world, basically. And in a sense, we try to understand ourselves while doing that, because we map the world in this machine to kind of replicate what is going on. But of course, what is going on is way more complex, you know. But humans have been doing this since ancient times. And I find, I find it very beautiful, you know, that it's, it's a kind of a reflection of our questions of what we are. And, and this is also why, I, I mean, most of my work is about computing, more or less. In the end, there is sound to it, but I think the central theme is like this, this weird machines, you know, like what is going on there with them. Any, any questions from the internet? Before, I, okay, so the internet is just fully satisfied or doing other stuff in the background. What was the question? I'm finding um, this common thread between a lot of your pieces between people's relationship to, to excess and um, shapes that have been seen as excessive, shapes that are not streamlined, and um, sort of this inherent misogyny that exists in the tech industry um, and uh, within music and within all of these different worlds and sort of your rejection of that misogyny. Um, as I'm looking at these shapes that are contained in fluidics, uh, it reminds me a lot, actually, in my context of Caribbean art, um, you know, things that have been rejected by um, certain, certain industries, certain silhouettes. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, yes, and of course, in a sense, yes. It's, uh, it's maybe it isn't it, because one of the reasons why I was also fascinated with these shapes is that I don't know if you noticed, but they look very vulva esque. They look like they're cl yeah. clitoris shapes. You know? yeah. And I thought, like, yeah, they, I mean, it's, it's a rejected technology, it's a slow technology, but it has its uh, peculiar beauty, you know. Like, and in that sense, I mean, I, I found it very interesting. Uh, to look into it and for sure you know there's so much other uh, interesting cultures and interesting things we did that are completely left apart you know we don't talk about them they're not in the history like nowhere you know so i think as artists it's good to dig a little bit and surface some of these things you know because they can be very helpful to create a good future for us you know i don't know i hope so <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> First of all, I find your work fascinating and wonderful. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring. Thank you. And <clears throat> also, I would like to ask you that um, the question about gender in the sense of design. Could we say the thesis about around um, the design from a female brain? I'm not talking about post-gender politics. Sorry about that. but. Uh, I'm, as I understand, you identify yourself as a woman and you operate in, you know, in this binary, which is okay. Um, for, in your experience and through your research, could you say like the thesis about a woman will design a computer in a completely different way as men have done it? Will that thesis be accurate or will it be problematic and why? Mm. <laughs> 
I think it could be problematic anyway. I think we have, yeah, in that sense, I think we have to get over this, like, yeah, this binarity and... Uh, I agree. It's, it's kind of part of, yeah, it's, it's a history. You know, I was showing this video with this women for, comp with the woman computer, which was, I mean, it's, a, it's actually a parody. It's not something that actually existed. It's part of a, I think it's a comic. Uh, yeah, yeah, re it's a, a look, look around you, right? This, this uh, series from Channel One or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, but it was just enforcing this, like, over-exaggerated, like... Uh, yeah, Sexism. Exactly, like how something is, like, way too much. And I, I played with that in an ironical way. So I took this character, I created this character, I made myself way too much. It was all very pink, very la-la-la. But it was a kind of a comment, so of course I'm not, like, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, too much, like, uh, how to say, say, praying for that. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's hard to say, you know, the history was written as it was written. If maybe yes, maybe not, you know, but I think, yeah, I think we just have to get out of this, uh, which is what, you know, that this is made by female, this is made by men or, you know, and go in a, in a new direction. I hope this will happen soon, you know, and we get over these gender boundaries as well. I totally agree <laughs> with you. That's why I formulate the question to see. <laughs> there is a for the way beyond binaries. Thank you. Yeah, we should also say that the, we, we shouldn't credit the invention development of computation to men because that would be inaccurate, especially yes. some major women, um, female figures in developing specific programming languages and doing a lot of the engineering and design. And so, yeah. Other questions? Uh, thank you, Joanna. Uh, truly captivating work, and I appreciate how your presentation and also your biography as an artist flows in the story that you tell, so thanks for that. I would like to ask a little bit uh, about the workshops that you run and you, that kind of entered your story. So could you tell a little bit like what happened there, who participated, mm. have you talked to them afterwards, and I'm yes, just curious I... about the... I'm workshops. doing this since years, actually, since I'm 23. I've been teaching a lot of workshops, so I, I had marathons of workshops already. And uh, it's it's very enjoyable, it's also very exhausting, but I, I love it, in a sense. Um, and it's uh, all around. I mean, I, I was doing some in Germany, I did in Romania. I was teaching with kids, I was teaching with teenagers this summer. Um, and usually it's the same formula, like I go there, and there's a, a theoretical introduction, which for instance, with the semiconductor, it was about the politics of parts. So we would do it like a little bit of history on different sides, uh, put it in a different perspective. And then we had always, I like to put people to touch the things. So we do a, like a hands-on exercise, which sometimes is building this transistor or building a machine or whatever it is. Uh, sometimes we did the energy harvesting. So we would go on the streets and uh, learn how to harvest energy. Um, and yeah, and then at the end, usually I like to do something collective, like a performance or, you know, I make the setups where I put them to work together for something. And yeah, it's, a, it's something that I'm doing for a while and I really enjoy it. It's almost, last year was more important than my artwork, but uh, yeah, this year I take a little break. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I don't take a complete break, but I take it slower because it was a lot of energy I was pumping into the workshops, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Do you, do you imagine that you might uh, adapt the fluidics stuff to a workshop kind I of have experience? To. Or you I have, have to. to. Yes. You have to. <laughs> yes. yes, because I, I'm invited in Linz where I did this research. Oh, you I, have to. Yeah, you yes. really have to. I really yeah. have to. <laughs> Yeah. It's super challenging. <laughs> I'm trying really hard, but it's, you know, they're like, as I, I brought these shapes for people to see, like, basically, this was the idea, like, each person would get some of these shapes, and then you plug them together, and you create a big machine, like a circuit. So this was the initial idea of the workshop, but I have to see if it actually works, and I have to, I mean, the shapes, each of them work, but how to make them do it, and I would also like them to create some of the shapes. So now I'm looking into paper fluidics, and how you can cut from paper paper and do like a circuit from paper fluidics. So yeah, because I like to have this hands-on part and just not just theoretical. So yeah, this is where I am actually. I'm preparing this workshop with the fluidics. <laughs> well, I really appreciate that you're extending your artistic practice in a way that's very 
uh, fluid, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> literally. Uh, yeah, yeah, literally. <laughs> and uh, bringing people into that, I think that's exciting. Even if sometimes it's because you have to, but you do it in a very organic way. Um, other questions? Yeah? Here comes a mic. There's a mic coming. I knew there was some reason that I was moderating. It's to do that. Um, thank you for your wonderful work and sharing. Uh, I want to ask about that. Um, you were mentioning that you want the participant of the workshop also to come up with um, different shapes. That have you been like researching and like inventing your own shape? Like how do you how how do you go through the process? Because it seems like they have a certain languages already. Yes. So I'm curious to hear a bit this more fluidics, about that. This fluidics, right? You talk about yes. this. Yes. Uh, yes. So it was kind of hard because there is there are a few books about it, like a cookbook, you know, like in electronics where you have the cookbooks. Um, but uh, it doesn't really write exactly how these shapes should look like. So sometimes you have a sketch, but sometimes you don't have a sketch. Um, and then uh, some of them, I found a patent, which was very useful, because then I could take that shape, I would vectorize it, and I would start engraving it, and then adjusting small angles until it actually worked. Because I would pump the water, I would see it's not working. So, OK, I changed this. It's not working. OK, I changed that. And like that, for five, six times, I would like engrave it and retry it and retry it. Uh, but with some shapes, like uh, I had to remake them completely, because they're made for air. And uh, air is different. And so sometimes you have vents that are for air. So a lot of of them are changed uh, for water. Um, and I think to make shapes, for sure, like it's, this is a, actually a very interesting input, like I will think about this. But there is possibility to do them, but you have to know the rules a little bit, you know? Because as I put this video, you have uh, these angles, the jets are coming, so then you can manipulate the jets with these shapes. And then if, um, this is a, it's actually a great, thank you so much for this, <laughs> I could ask them to do, but yes, it's, it's, uh, it's quite tricky to make it work. So in, in uh, theory, it it's looks simple, like you make a shape like this and then you put water into it. But to actually have that effect happening, it's very, very difficult. So I managed to get 13 shapes working out of maybe there's more. Some are analog, some are digital, but they can all be used analog because it's actually work with matter. You, so you don't have this binary constriction at all. So all of them, in a sense, are analog. You're not in this uh, digital field anymore more you know so yeah I think that's that's possible it could be that uh, you can come up with new shapes uh, and uh, it's a it's an idea for sure like at the moment I'm in the archiving process so I'm like an archivist I search I retransform I convert them and I bring them all in the same format so that they are accessible you know and I will see like if I can come up with new shapes that would be cool yeah, I really feel like you are discovering an um, ancient languages or something. Yes, it feels like it. <laughs> it's Thank very you. entertaining. Maybe one last question. Well, you have to. A hand that was such there. a yeah. It, it, it's, it's too enthusiastic to turn down. Hello. Hello. Uh, just a few corrections about technically. Um, does it work better on 2D or 3D as a shape? And uh, the other one is, do you need like uh, external energy to make it start? Yes. Uh, well, uh, it works. Initially, they were designed exactly like this 2D. So this was the way all the fluidics were made in this kind of, I don't know if the presentation, oh no, it's not on anymore. Um, they were all created in two slices of materials that you sandwich, you make a sandwich, you have the shape in there, industrially craved in. And uh, the way these are designed, they're designed for 2D. What I did before was that I made it 3D. And this uh, raised a lot of complications, actually, because I, which I didn't consider, because I was like, oh, it's going to work. And it didn't really work, but it kind of worked. It was like really kind of worked. Because actually there you have a surface, that, so because it's, uh, you obtain more roundness, then the jet doesn't know anymore where to flow. So it starts to go everywhere. So it's a bit more complicated. So te technically, you should do them 2D, not 3D. So 
if you want to use the knowledge that is already gathered by all these other people, you should do them 2D, but I, I'm sure it's possible to do them 3D as well, so properly. So I already tried that, and I still want to try a little bit more. Bec but, you know, it's just that it gives so much uh, complication to it that it's, it becomes harder to to contain it. And the second thing, which we're asking about the power, uh, for sure, at the moment, like, you're supposed to pump that air and the water in it. Now you can also use a gravity pump. So you don't need to use, actually, uh, uh, an electric pump. You could use a gravity pump. And this is what I'm actually looking into it. So the gravity pump is a device with, I think, six containers. And somehow, through the way of the fall of the water, it pushes up. Uh, or you could also use a container up, and that kind of flows through the natural flow. The only thing is that they kind of require specific uh, pressure. It's, it, I mean, there is range, but there is uh, one pressure which works the best to form this beautiful jet that you can work with. Yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah, totally. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I guess that's the time we have for today. Although I'd say to the Hack Lab participants, feel free to hang out and, and say hi or check out these, uh, get, come take a look at these closer for those of you who are in the room. Um, but we have to break for now and uh, come back at five o'clock. There's another talk. Uh, but thank you so much. What a, what a, what a mind-blowing experience. <laughs>